Hello and welcome to this film which is all about a machine called the mass spectrometer. Now these machines are useful to us in all sorts of different ways but I suppose they're connected to what we've been talking about with atoms and isotopes because one of the main uses of these things is to allow us to determine what proportions of different isotopes there are of an element in a sample of that element. Okay, so we're not going to look at how we get to that information from a mass spectrometer in this film, that will come up in the next film. But here we're going to look at how the machine actually works. So by the end of this film, hopefully you'll know the names of the processes that take place in the spectrometer and what order they happen in. And also you'll know what a mass spectrum looks like, that is the output from one of these machines, and what it tells us about the particles that went through this machine. Okay, so to start with, let's just have a quick look at what a mass spectrum looks like and what it is. Uh, spectrum. The word spectrum means a range of things, so basically the output from one of these machines tells us about a range of different masses, and we can see here on the x-axis that we've got a range of different masses. Okay, so although it says m over z, which means mass charge ratio, these are basically the same as the mass of the particles. Okay, so there were particles with a mass of 35 traveling in this mass spectrometer that gave us this mass spectrum, and there were particles with a mass of 37. And on the y-axis of one of these mass spectrums is the abundance of these different particles, which might be a percentage, it might just be a relative abundance, and we'll see the difference between those two things soon. Um, but what this mass spectrum basically tells me is that out of every 100 particles that travelled through this mass spectrometer, about 75 of them had a mass of 35, and about 25 of them had a mass of 37. Okay, now we'll have a look at how it is that the machine actually gets to producing a graph like this over the next few slides. Okay, so first of all, let's just quickly name the five different processes that we need to be aware of in the mass spectrometer, and then we'll have a look at each one of them in detail. There's vaporization, ionization, acceleration, deflection, and detection. And the whole name of the game here is basically to get atoms of this sample M to travel through this tube to a detector. So let's look at how these five processes are going are to enable us to get the atoms from one end of the machine to the other. Now we've got to start by vaporizing the sample. Now if we want atoms of our sample to travel through this tube, it's no good just trying to get a big solid lump of it and at this end of the tube and trying to fire it through here because we'll just get millions and millions of atoms trying uh, to get through here in one great big clump. So the point of vaporizing the sample is simply to get the atoms apart from one another so that they can travel through this tube one by one. Okay, now having done that, having vaporized the sample, basically just heated it up in the absence of air so it doesn't burn, we've now got to get the particles ionized, that is we've got to give them a charge so that we can accelerate them in a moment. Okay, now we'll explain why in the acceleration stage why it's useful to have a charge, but basically to give the particles a charge, so, so that is to turn them from atoms of M into positive ions of M, we pass them through this electron gun, which basically fires high energy electrons at the individual atoms and knocks other electrons off the atoms. So people often think that we'll turn them into negative ions by firing electrons at them, but the point is here that we're knocking other electrons off the atoms with this electron gun. Okay, and now that we've ionized our sample, now that we've turned the atoms into positive ions, the beauty of this is now that these particles can be attracted to a metal, uh, to an electrically charged plate. So when they were neutral atoms, this charge would have no effect on them. But now that they're positive ions, if we stick um, this negatively charged plate in here, they're all going to feel an attraction towards it, and they're going to get accelerated towards this plate. Now, we they'll be traveling in so, all sorts of... Although they're heading towards the plate, they're still traveling in some sort of random directions. Okay, so we want to focus them into a beam, so there's a slit in the middle of this negatively charged plate so that we're focusing all these atoms that well, sorry ions that we've accelerated towards here we're focusing them into a narrow beam okay so the acceleration is done by this oppositely charged electrical plate which just attracts these ions towards itself and speeds them up traveling them in all in one direction 
focusing them with this slit. Okay. Now that they're traveling really fast through this tube, some of them will make it round the bend and some won't. Now clearly they've got no inclination of their own accord to just go round this bend. They'd rather just carry on in a straight line unless some force acts on them obviously. So we put this magnetic field in their way and that will bend them round the tube. But some of them will get bent more than others and we're asking the question here can we make some qualitative predictions so without any numbers involved just who will do more about which ions will get deflected most okay so which ions will be most affected by this magnetic field well if you think about it very heavy ions will not get bent as much by this force as very light ones okay so light ions will hit the inside of the bend heavy ions will hit the outside of the bend and only ions of a certain mass will be able to make it round here and through this second slit. So in other words, what we can do by altering the magnetic field here is we can choose what mass of ion will get through the spectrometer. So basically we can type in a mass that we'd like to get through the spectrometer and the machine will go, right, I know what magnetic field I need to have in order to achieve that. And then we can see if any particles are coming through with that mass. And so now we're kind of on to our final stage, which is detection. And here the machine is going, right, now you've told me what mass particles you'd like to get through here. I'm going to see if any are actually coming through. Okay, so it uses this ion detector to basically count how many ions are coming through here. And if you remember what the graph looks like at the end, is it's basically a count of how many ions of each particular mass came through. Now we can see here there weren't any with a mass of 36 or 38 or 39, but when we set the mass to 35 and 37 particles did come through, and what the detector told us was that there were a lot more particles with a mass of 35 than there were with a mass of 37. Okay, so they're the five stages again. They're really important to know their names, what's going on in them, and what order they happen in. And hopefully, now that you've watched this film, you feel like you've got a good idea of those things. If you don't, if there's any questions that you'd like to ask, or if you're curious about anything, then please feel free to come and see me, or to post a comment on YouTube.